Warning, the following program contains adult language, adult themes, and spoilers. Viewer discretion is advised. Good evening and welcome to this week's episode, actually this month's episode of this week's episode. I'm your host, Evan Goldstein. With me as always is the train traveling pe- preacher who was in on it, Chris Randazzo. I put the me in taxidermy. <laughs> the traveling insurance sales lady, Karen Randazzo. This is an ex parrot <laughs> and the landlady who knows yes, nothing to be. <laughs> about personal space, Angie Fernot. Oh no, after you, dear. Oh no. We here on this week's episode talk television. This week was my choice. I chose <laughs> a <laughs> Tales of the Unexpected wild um but before we get into that here's your weekly reminder that you can get in touch with us at mail at geekade.com tell us what uh you've been watching give us suggestions on things to watch watch the things that we watch and then talk to us about those things that have been watched because then we watch what you watch and you watch what we watch and we don't know you it's watch what we watch, watch, what watch. <laughs> but yeah please just reach out and let us know what we're, what's going on and we'd love to hear from you so it's been a month or so. This is actually not this month's episode. It's like, so the way the schedule is shaking out, because we had to put it off for another week, this episode isn't going to happen until September. September. So this will, this will this be is next, so August. This is, <laughs> so this will be the first September one if we actually manage to get... Actually, no, because I went and put the schedule together, and it looks like even recording on time if we can cons- if we consistently stick with the way everything's working out the next episode won't be until october 2nd the september episode will be october 2nd technically it'll still be in september for early access and i think the same thing goes with this one yes my uh, brain uh, hurts no, no, no and all what. i got from that is that this is an <laughs> october episode Sep- and august yeah and uh and we do things we yeah. make a podcast no it's not gonna this early access for will not be yeah it, no matter be, what we've borked august <laughs> august has been borked yeah um we are but sorry august, august here so fuck stuff september happened. will happen you have to forgive me because it was my birthday month yeah that's happy that's birthday right. beautiful you. lady happy month day yes <sighs> thank you thank you tell me more about how you love me please please stop <laughs> tell me more say less so we <laughs> i know we um, have been i had covid busy. this month and i can't stop coughing sorry uh, what were you i saying? also you COVID? had covid just just don't act like you were the only one who got covid around here no i'm not acting like that i'm just <laughs> saying that i did yeah that's we all got. did the kids got it and they didn't fucking care they were just like, yeah, they really didn't. knows. Yeah, my throat might hurt ever so slightly. <laughs> and I was fucking dead for a solid 24 hours. Just, just. I took him to urgent care, you guys. It was not okay. I was oh, begging for death. It was, it was, it was bad. And they're at urgent care. They were just like, yeah, we don't really do anything for COVID anymore. Just, uh, you know, get a straw and suck it up. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Mer- go, That's not all. They did give you some stuff. They gave me something to fight the nausea, and then, um... Nausea? They, uh... Yeah, I got hit with everything all at once. Like, the next day, I wasn't fine, but I was, you know, ambulatory. <laughs> but for one day, it was just like, and here are all the symptoms. All of them. Wow. at one, Like, that moment at the end of The Crow, when the, he, he always says, you know, 30 years of pain all at once, all for you. That's what happened to me. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but I do. Way to bring up a topical reference there, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> hey, no problem. Hey, there's a new Crow movie out there. I heard it's fucking terrible. Oof, yeah. We don't talk about yeah. that. Oof. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. Not good. <laughs> but, oh, did you see it? No. No. no because we are not monsters and we're not going to watch that trash. <laughs> we're going to watch it out of sheer morbid curiosity. Ah, uh, you Just might. to get angry at ourselves <laughs> for watching it. <laughs> 
Honey, you see how mad I get when I don't like the thing that I'm watching? You really think I'm going to want to invest my time into this? Like, this is Mark another level of rage. It's there might be actual, like, spousal abuse over this. <laughs> so, so this is what's going to happen. Speaking of, like, I'm shit movies. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Speaking <laughs> of shit movies I was unable to watch, when I had COVID last time, uh-huh. I decided to spend my time watching the first uh, Venom movie because I hadn't seen it. And Venom, it looked stupid. Venom, 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 Venom. Uh, and I was like, well, I'm already suffering, so <laughs> I should see this. And so I did, and I watched it, and it was stupid. Uh, and. I went to watch the second one uh, while well, I had my second COVID, mm-hmm. and uh, the sound on the copy that you have just stops about 20 minutes in. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so I, so I, instead I watched a... Oh, and that's what I'm going to... You know what? I think that's what I'll talk about. Okay. No, I, it's not what I'll talk about. I was going to talk about The Dragon Prince. I watched the whole new season of The Dragon Ooh. Prince while it was uh, covid out, totally and it was quite good. But no, I had something else I want to talk about as my... As my topic, so, uh, yeah, move move on. Shuffle, shuffle on. Don't look here. Everything's fine. Said the guy who's talking. Okay. What? <laughs> you guys had a way better reason to push <laughs> off record. Oh, Jesus Christ. Wow. <laughs> Hold on. Let me note the time for the... <clears throat> wow. I had, a, I had an opportunity to host Quizzo tonight, and that's why I passed up on it. $200 down the toilet because of my stupid cough. Quizzo is. St- oh, man, I, I would pay you two hundred dollars to stop coughing right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, then I'll I got money, invited I out to coughing. that game. By the way, was somebody that? somebody texted me and was like, "You want to go to Quizzo tonight at JD's?" And I'm like, "Uh, I can't." Oh, <laughs> <laughs> what if I could? But I can't. Man, the amount of traveling I did at one point in time to go see Chris do Quizzo was wild. <laughs> Can someone explain what the hell Quizzo it's, is? It's, it's bar, bar trivia. trivia. Oh, that's Quizzo is like the brand name or whatever. But yes, it's bar trivia. Chris You're was the very brand and, uh, He was very friend good. of mine. Is a um, he hosts a couple of shows nearby, uh, but he's also a professional voice actor, mm-hmm. and uh, he's been getting a decent amount of work lately. And sometimes that bumps up against his Quizzo schedule. Um, so it's two dollars, two hundred dollars a night, which is, I mean, great. Uh, it's not super hard work. It was like riding a bike, figuring out how to do it again. Uh, and the work doesn't come up very often, but when it does, you know, I usually jump on it because it's two hundred goddamn dollars, and we need the money. The kids need braces, oh, and these ain't cheap. But uh, yeah, I was like, yeah, I'm already really tired because we had a long fucking weekend, and today was a really long fucking day. Um. But really, the worst part of it was the, the coughing. I was like, I could pull heaven and earth together and earn us two hundred dollars, but um, no. there's no way I'm going to be able to host the show and not be hacking into the microphone all the time. And that just sounds like a bad plan. So, sounds like the right move to be made is to step away. Good job, sir. You can edit the coughs out here. I can't edit the coughs out of hosting a live uh, trivia <laughs> show. <laughs> that is true. I dare you to try. Oh, well, it should be noted that the other reason that we had a hell of a long weekend is that because by the time people hear this, our son, our firstborn, will be 11 years old. Ugh, Woo-hoo! Yep. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, I know. Just, oh, my ow. God. That's You're not my, his parent. My back hurts now. <laughs> yeah. ow, 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 ow. So ow. her her uh, her sister bought our kids for John's birthday. I don't really understand. It doesn't matter cars they they purchased a uh one of those indoor basketball arcade game things what to put it to put in our house okay and uh i'm sorry this seems like they, a mistake well you know they no. really enjoyed it when they've played it in various places mm-hmm. and uh she sent me this link for this one well a picture it's like this is how big this is there is a smaller one but i think this one's way cooler um, let me know if it'll fit. I did some tertiary measuring. I was like, you know what? It's going to be extremely tight. But what the hell? <laughs> That's what so, she said. <laughs> Giggity. Aww. So I got it. I built it. It didn't fit. Uh, <laughs> you know, big, big surprise. It was so close. The problem was, really, I made it work in this the, the corner that I had it in, which is where the arcade cabinet was oh, before. Um, I had a way to make it fit in there. The problem was the ducts in the ceiling mm-hmm. blocked the basketball hoops. 
So even though I actually made this enormous fucking thing fit in the basement, there was no way to actually play it. <laughs> just so what I did was I moved it around like and just set it up in this open area in the basement where it did physically fit, but like makes the space completely unusable. So we played around with it for a whole bunch today, and then I took it all apart, and we're boxing it back up. We're getting the smaller one. Nice. Well played. <laughs> I like but that you tried it first. it was so exhausting to build this thing. <laughs> it was... God, I want to say it took like three hours of trying to screw this thing together. Um, oh, the tiny it little took Al- a lot. Allen key? <laughs> yeah, there was one little Allen key, and I wound up you know, using my own tools and stuff, but... Ooh, fancy. Oh, my God. It was... Uh, j- just because like the, the stuff that was in there was, was going to make it take a bajillion years longer. But the, the instructions... On one hand, were great because every single piece was clearly numbered. Every screw and every piece of metal piping had a clear number on it, so I could always tell which piece went where. The problem was the order of which they told me to assemble this thing was fucking bananas. <laughs> they were like, all right, now build all this shit, put all this stuff on the backboard, then lift the backboard up with all the pieces in the basket and all this attached, and put it onto the, the metal piping. And after it was all done, I'm like, you know what I should have done was I put a, put the backboard up there, and when the backboard was being held by the piping that I already built, then I would have all of my hands free to put the hoops and stuff on. Mm-hmm. Instead, I'm like trying to lay the, the 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 backboard somewhere that I could attach the front and the back of this stupid hoop stuff to. It was ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And it was a really fun thing. It was really, really <laughs> fun. Like <laughs> Ellie was just obsessing over it all day. She had a blast. I think the smaller one's going to be just fine. So there we go. That's the story. Why I'm tired. COVID and basketball. Yeah. I mean, it it wasn't just today. It was the whole weekend and his party and the cousins sleeping over and my sister brought her giant dog again. So it was (laughs) a lot. Sounds like you really enjoyed your dog. I just got called Kirk in an email. Okay, Kirk. My name's right there. <laughs> it's, it's, I, it's, it's you just look at it. It's four letters. What do you mean? How do you fuck that when up? Did you stop being Kirk? K- I don't understand. Is it Kirk with a K? <laughs> Haven't you always been yeah. Kirk? It's it's it's, it's maybe they it's, knew that your nickname is the Captain, and they just assumed. Oh, maybe. I said hi, Kirk. Yeah, sure, we can help. Like, okay. Hey, first off, this company has been ignoring us for like I don't know two months now. I keep sending them emails. And then if they finally just respond super quick today, but they call me the wrong name. It's fine. It's fine. I don't mind being called Kirk via email. You're a little feisty tonight. I am feeling feisty. I'm, I'm finally not super hot because I'm in a basement. There's a fan. I have some cold water. I'm going to talk about TV shows. It's going to be fun. Uh, is it? I don't know. I'm a little scared. <laughs> so we had a show this past weekend. <laughs> That's why we, we couldn't record on last Thursday. We had a show, <laughs> and it was really good, and we have a store now. Yes, we opened yes. up. Tell us about the store. It's a store, <laughs> and it has art. Uh, no, we, okay, so we, it's like a, a booth space in a, in a market. So this indoor market that opened up, um, Imagine in a, the South, it's a thing. Yeah, it's not it's, a thing up north. <laughs> no, and that's what I'm trying to figure out. The best way to explain it is that if you imagine um, the vendor spaces, if you've ever gone to like a comic convention or anything where vendors get a designated amount of space and then they set up whatever it is they're selling, um, think more exhibitor style than like artist alley style, but now take it and make it a permanent retail installation. And so. They took these this this old store that I think was a furniture store previously, and they uh, built walls in sort of a grid pattern throughout the space of varying sizes, and then they are basically renting out like three walls, and then you know one side's obviously open, so you can walk by and see everything, um, and you can choose the size of the space and the location if you know depending on what's available. Um, and you set up your own little booth slash shop um, and you sell your products in it. They had an approval and vetting process and um, we have like monthly rent now and, you know, like all of the things as if it were a real store and my art is hanging on the walls and we have to eventually like decorate the space. And 
when we signed the contract, we had looked at it. We had five days uh, for them to hold the space for us. And then uh, basically the fifth day we went in and decided to sign. And then we had 24 hours to turn it around because the day after uh, the two days after that was the grand opening. So we went in like Thursday night, signed everything, did all of the prep on Friday, went in, set everything up, made it ready and then started. And then I sat there because Evan unfortunately had to work that Saturday. um, And then I sat there the entirety of the day on Saturday to uh, promote the space and make sales. But I have to shout out Evan for this because um, Evan is not a patient person and he was very patient with me going through this process and built custom shelving for the space um, to make sure that we could, you know, display the stuff the way we want to. Um, And so the whole thing is like a white space with just some random carpet and you can put your own flooring down. You can paint the walls, you can stain the wood or paint the wood, however you want it to be. And right now we've just left everything neutral so that we can actually like use the space and see how we want it to function before we try to decorate it. But like he literally did like a 3d mock-up that week of what the space could be so that we would have an understanding of like how we were going to lay everything out. And then we, he actually like executed, like he built the things to go in the space so that we could do all the stuff. Like it was absolutely incredible. Friday morning was not fun. No, it was not. It was, (laughs) oh my gosh, it was crazy. He was out in like 98 degree weather with a thousand percent humidity. He was borderline on fire trying to cut wood, which, you know, isn't a great mix. Um, no. You know that you know the amount of sweat that you have to produce to make your clothes change color? Like that's how bad it was. He outside. sweat through all of his clothes. Yeah. It was really gross. It was horrible. But yeah, we did it. Um and we have uh we now have a monthly overhead. I'm not freaking out at all. Um but it's an opportunity to take steps toward like our long term goal and dream of having a real retail space that supports other artists and creatives. And now we are in control of an, in a space that will let us do it. What's, what's really great. So exciting. Thank you. What's awesome about it is that like, let's say it does like our original layout doesn't work. We have the ability to, to adjust and change however we want. If we want to bring another artist, if we want to, you know, completely remodel, remodel the whole area. It's, it's our, 60 or 60 square feet per se kind of thing and the other surrounding booths are of a higher quality it's not like it like the closest thing unfortunately up north that i could think of is like an indoor flea market yeah and it's not that it's it's like a mall with just like one wall missing out of every store so like you can see directly into it and it's it's a really neat it's a classy flea market and hopefully it, it we figure out how to like we really went in real quick and just put stuff on the walls and try to fill it with what what was okay so we took all of the stuff that we normally do at shows and put that in the booth. Then we had to restock and refigure out what we're doing for the next weekend because the next weekend we had a show kind of thing. So, boy, do I know what that's like. Oof, it's not yeah. fun. especially. Not- I do. I have, I have that problem on a much smaller scale with my like cubby at the store that I'm selling in, where yeah. I'm like, I'm I'm right now making extras of things uh, so that I can have them on display in the store and have them at a show at the same time. But my stuff is all handmade, so mm. it's just really friggin' tricky. What's, yeah. what's uh. also nuts is like things that I didn't think about. Like we have to label the furniture as not being for sale, like uh-huh. because we like it's not. It's to hold our shit up, and technically right. speaking, <laughs> yeah. But that's the type of thing that yeah. someone might want might to want. buy there, right? And what's funny is we're like across the aisle is actually a guy who's making furniture out of the same type of stuff that Evan did. That's kind of how we got the idea. Evan was like, yeah, I can can totally make make this. (laughs) And it was fantastic. He absolutely did. I mean, mine is much rougher looking because I had four hours, but I was pretty impressed with myself. (laughs) I was too. We're pretty impressed with you too. Yeah, every Uh, now and then. So yes, we have all been very, very busy, but I'm pretty sure we have all watched some sort of television. So, yes. Who wants to go first? I'll get it out of the Chris way. Chris does. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm does. doing 
I'm doing a Parks and Rec rewatch for the first time in several years, and uh, it's a TV <laughs> show that I am loving, and it has people that I also adore. The end. I have, yeah, I've never watched, I've watched like an episode or two here and there of it. Um, I enjoy this show so much that I'm like, it's almost perfect except for Aziz. Aziz is like the literal worst. For anyone who doesn't know that, that's the character. I'm sorry. You can't, you cannot say that with this show because there is a character who is actually the worst. No, so but the here's the worst. thing: if it, wasn't, <laughs> if it wasn't for Aziz, that guy wouldn't be on the show. <laughs> Which, whatever his name, John Ralphio. Jo- John Ralphio. John Ralphio, John Ralphio is Ralphio. not the worst. <laughs> who is the worst? Oh. John Ralphio. John Ralphio's sister, who he introduces oh. as the, the worst. worst. We, haven't we haven't gotten not. there. Really, you haven't gotten to Mona Lisa yet. Yeah. I mean, Funny. you can say that you hate Aziz. I'm sorry. You, you can say you hate Tom Haverford. That's fine. But in the confines of this specific show. You just can't say that that character is the right. worst because another character literally owns that title. All right. <laughs> so I'm assuming that's the one that I see the meme of, of don't, yes. be, don't be suspicious. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Be, don't suspicious. be suspicious. Yeah. Don't be suspicious. <laughs> so yeah, we're enjoying it. I yeah. freaking love that show. That Me show too. is so good. And I saw, I was watching TikTok this morning and, and it was just Amy Poehler like, as herself, no makeup, just like a regular person having their coffee in the morning and doing one of those, like, can you remember all these songs from the 90s? And like, she remembered them all. But it was like, oh, Amy Poehler's just normal. I love her. Yeah, she's amazing. And I really, I like, part of me really hopes she loves waffles as much as Leslie Nope does. Oh, I don't even know if that's possible, but I mean... It is possible, it Chris, is possible. because I love them I as love much Waffle, as lovely. I mean. no- yeah, j- listen. Hey, come on Nobody but nope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we're me. having fun with Parks and Rec. I mean, I'll, I'll jump in real quick because my show leads off of that. I'm watching a show called Unstable. Um, it's a show that came out, uh, like I think, two years ago, and it stars Rob Lowe and his son, John Lowe. And they play father and son and he is like uh, um, the head of this um, I don't want to say tech like a um, a science company they're they're innovating things left and right it's all wild but he's crazy like <laughs> he's nuts and they bring his son in to like sort of like rein him in because apparently they like he lost his wife and, and he went down a dark path kind of thing but <clears throat> I don't I I can't remember Rob Lowe acting in the past. All I know is current day Rob Lowe and he is the same character in every show. Like the grinder, the <laughs> the guy from Parks and Rec, this guy like they're all shades of the same color kind of thing. And he does it phenomenally. And seeing him and his son act together it's also a lot of fun they play really well off of each other so it's a it's it's quite entertaining it's called unstable i, I recommend that one too fred Armisen. i was gonna really ask it. if it was a show about my life um <laughs> <laughs> not no. unstable enough <laughs> yeah it's not that bad come on now. um yeah so that's what we're watching what uh what else you guys got Karen, go. Uh, I, yeah. Okay. Oh, somebody go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll go. Mine's a little bit less interesting, I think. Okay. Uh, I, I, I did mention earlier that I watched um, the, the current season of The Dragon Prince, which dropped, and there's the next season is theoretically the last one. It's tying up the Mystery of Erevos storyline. Um, and it's, it, it's still a pretty wonderful show. But the one that I wanted to talk about was uh, something I've been slowly rewatching in the background and has just... Uh, Cotton to the point where it started getting really good again is uh, I jumped back into watching the original Dragon Ball, ah! and uh, it's very easy to forget why this show was so special in the first place. Uh, when you look at what Dragon Ball is now, it's it's very very bombastic. It's very um, you know screaming and lasers shooting everywhere and planetary destruction and stuff. And the original show is is oddly sweet and it takes place in a really interesting world um 
and uh like the first season kind of hits that pretty well and then uh the second story arc is like by far my least favorite part of dragon ball and it's such a slog to get through with the red ribbon army it's just like okay they go and they try to fight this army over and over again and it's just kind of bland but um after that you start getting into all the really fun mystical stuff which is like this reminds me of why i fell in love with this show in the first place like you know he goes to uh try to find the he can't find the dragon balls because one of them isn't showing up on the radar so he finds this like floating fortune teller woman who uh makes them fight all these weird demon monsters and stuff and if he can win then she'll tell him where the dragon ball is and the last person he has to fight is his dead grandfather uh which is just the the sweetest scene in the world when um like he's he he knows how to beat goku because he's the one who trained him right and this is when goku's still a little kid Mm -hmm. and like he's he's this this character that you he's kind of fearless and kind of dopey because he was raised in the woods. Uh, and they, you know, there's still this, this comedy of him kind of learning what, how the world works because he was raised alone in the woods. And it's this extremely rare scene where you get to see little kid Goku get like super emotional because after he fights him, uh, for a while, he, he kind of figures cause he's wearing a mask. He kind of figures out who he is. And like, he just breaks down and hugs him and he's like, so glad to see him. And, it's it's this super cute thing, and um the the mission that he's on right now is training for the next world martial arts tournament, which I always love those in the show because it's these really fun culminations of everything the character learns, right? Because the whole the way that the structure of Dragon Ball works before Dragon Ball Z is it's all about what what things is Goku going to do where he's going to learn uh, how to become stronger and what limits is he going to push past to tackle the next, you know, show's villain, which almost ultimately, almost always ends up at a world martial arts tournament. Um, and the one that he's on now is a, his master uh, told him that he wasn't going to be able to teach him anymore and that what he needed to do was to learn from life. So he needed to go out into the world and just explore and but he wasn't allowed to use like his magic flying cloud or anything. He had to walk everywhere he went. Uh <laughs> so like the the show is like him walking from like weird village to village because the world that this show takes place in is this completely bizarre alternate reality earth where like there's just like all kinds of cult- different weird cultural villages all over the place like he'll go to one village where it's being tormented by this guy that has like a magic jar that can send people to like another dimension or some weird shit like that. And it's just all this super goofy, bizarre, crazy imaginative anime stuff that just fills my heart with joy. And since I'm background watching it, I can't watch it in Japanese, which is unfortunate because some of the American voices are pretty grating. <coughs> and the show has got some serious misogyny problems. Like, <laughs> Oh God, there's some really, really bad stuff in this show. Um, but as a you know, as an adult, I can look past that and just enjoy the good stuff uh, uh, over the bad. Um, and it's 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 a it's, it's just been a really really fun uh, thing to go back through because after Kira Toriyama passed away, I was like, I'm gonna go and rewatch all of Dragon Ball, and it was kind of slow going for there when I got through the Red Ribbon Army stuff. But now that I'm past that and we're we're meeting my favorite character, uh, Tian Shinhan. Uh, who starts off the series as a villain and then eventually uh, becomes friends with Goku and years and years later in Dragon Ball Z has like my favorite scene of any character ever because, you know, the characters through this, the series get obscenely powerful, right? They just get so ridiculously super Saiyans and the glowy hair and this dude's a human and he's like, you know, a superhuman because he's still a Dragon Ball Z character but he never gets anywhere even like close to what the 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 saiyan alien characters can become and there's this scene where he's facing off against like the the big new villain cell who's just again obscenely powerful and uh he basically sacrifices himself to slow him down like he just knows he knows he's not gonna be able to beat him but he has this move that can slow him down and it kills him do the move but he just keeps doing it over and over again because he's like no fuck you, you're not going anywhere. I'm going to hold you here until I'm dead. And that's going <laughs> to stull you down so that we can, so that somebody stronger than me can stop you. It is one of the most 
balls out moves I've ever seen. And Tien's such a great character uh, for that scene. But I just got to the point where we meet him for the first time, and it's it's super exciting to see. Um, I love that show. I really do. And I love a lot of people who know Dragon Ball have never watched the original Dragon Ball because most people start with Dragon Ball Z, and it's all about Goku and Vegeta and the giant laser fights and all Lots that stuff. And don't get me wrong. Screaming. I love that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I am all about that shit, but there is such a wonderful charm and uh, to the original show that's far more comedic and far more um, uh, just kind of wide-eyed, uh, all about taking in the, the wonder that is the world around you. Like, it's, you know, the whole point of it is just you. Ha- there's something to learn from everywhere. There's, there's always something new to learn. There's always someone more uh, stronger than you or somebody who knows more than you like you're never going to be the best at everything uh or even if you are you'll never know it because the world's too big to know for sure that you're the best at something and that's okay that's exciting in fact like to know that there's always going to be something else to learn that's the excitement and that's what's so so good about uh, goku as a character when he's a kid uh, in particular because you know, the the whole thing that happens in the uh, earlier in the show, like the when the first sorry the second story arc uh, actually ends in the World Martial Arts Tournament is his his master fights him in disguise because he's like if he goes there and he wins he's going to think that he's already mastered everything and there's nobody else to beat him so I have to go there and kick his ass as somebody that he's never seen before so that he will know for sure that there's always going to be some somewhere else something else to learn. Because he has such unlimited potential uh, to think that you've learned everything, uh, then become complacent would just be a, a tragedy. And I freaking love that. And I, I love that about the about the way the show works of just kind of teaching whoever's watching it that there's always something to learn from everywhere. There's always something to learn from other cultures. And uh, no matter how good you are, even if you're even if you're stronger than the, the than somebody else or you're more knowledgeable than somebody else they could know something that you don't know that could make what you know better like there's mm-hmm. always something to learn mm-hmm. it's a very uncle iroh-ish kind of thing like mm-hmm. when he's mm-hmm. talking to zuko about how learning uh the different bending techniques from all the all the different uh uh, uh nations instead of just the fire nation like that's the only way to become a well-rounded person and i you know i've just i've always loved that lesson so Dragon Ball is wonderful. I'm really happy to be rewatching it. And if you are a Dragon Ball fan and you've never actually watched the original Dragon Ball, do yourself a favor and go back and watch it. It's weird, it's different, and it's got some some <laughs> extremely rough edges, but it's very rewarding. <coughs> well, you almost made it. Almost. I know. I was so. I did. I, so I tried. Proud. I was hanging on for dear life, trying not to cough. <laughs> I'm very proud of you for getting as far as you did, sir. Thank you so much. I tried. Uh, yeah, I, it, it's wild the 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 variation from like Dragon Ball to Dragon Ball Z. So glad you're getting the chance to rewatch it. It gets there, which is interesting. Like by the end of the show, it is a very natural progression mm-hmm. from point A to point B. And like by the end of the show, there's definitely lots of like kamehamehas and lasers and stuff like that. Um, because you know, Goku, I think that Dra- Dragon Ball ends when he's like late teens, early twenties, and like that's where Dragon Ball Z picks up. And Z started as this story of Gohan taking his place, right? Like Gohan, his kid, is like the focal point. So it's like seeing the the world through Goku's eyes, but when there's a little kid that's kind of like him, but also very not like him, kind of going through the same trials and tribulations that he did. Mm-hmm. Um. That was the original focal point of the show, and then it kind of betrayed that eventually as what became more popular was adult Goku beating the crap out of super powerful beings. (laughs) Wildly (laughs) overpowered humans. Got you. All right. Well, appreciate it, sir. Karen, what do you got? (sighs) My beloved Umbrella Academy has come to an end. Oh, boy. Okay. Okay. I need you to talk about this because I had a friend who said that they wanted me to watch it so that I could talk about how bad it was. I could understand why someone would say that. <laughs> no! Um, no! They didn't, they didn't stick the landing. Oh, um, no. Boo. Um, 
which isn't to say it's bad. They I didn't, didn't think fall it, on their face. They didn't fall on their face. They just, you know, stumbled a little bit. Um, uh, the the ending itself, uh, I get. It makes sense. Uh, some people might call it like you know a cop out, akin to it was all a dream. Okay. Um, but to my uh, to my estimation, I I look at it more as like there's an infinite number of universes with the Umbrella Academy in it, and like no matter what they do, the world always ends. And this th- this core of umbrellas um, evolves enough, goes through enough character growth over the four seasons of the show to realize that the only way to uh to save the world is to sacrifice themselves basically got you um and i appreciated that do i think that they really nailed all of these characters actually having that amount of growth i don't know that i can agree with that statement okay. uh luther for example i just <sighs> He felt like he didn't have much to do this season. Mm. Um, I and I felt bad for him. Um, Diego, uh, he his journey was okay. There was one. They were making fun of him the whole season for like he's become. Could they pick up six years later um, after Jesus. the last season? Okay. And they have they they all kind of went their own ways. They're still, like, in touch with each other, but they're not doing Umbrella stuff anymore. Um, and so Diego and Lila are raising their kids together. And the joke with Diego the whole season is that he's, like, an out-of-shape dad who, like, has a lame, pathetic job, and, and Lila's a, you know, over-stressed-out mom, and they're just, like, their lives are kind of miserable compared to, like, how it was when they were in the Umbrella Academy. Mm-hmm. Um, and they keep making fun of Diego for being out of shape, and then there's a fight scene late in the season <laughs> where Diego's shirt comes off, and it's like, you mm-hmm. can't make the, those jokes the whole time and then have the actor look like that, because he looks amazing. <laughs> look? Just, that does not wait. compute. <laughs> it really took me out of it. It was annoying. Um... You know, Allison has like she whole her whole thing the whole time was trying to get back to her daughter, and she does. Um, and some stuff, and and she also wants to be with the husband that she got in season two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. season two. Um, and so that she that happens, but then it kind of doesn't work out the way like it's not the happily ever after that she was hoping for. But she does get to a good place. Um. Then Klaus is four. Klaus's arc is really interesting. I preferred his character is very different this season. I prefer the off the rails Klaus to this Klaus, mm. but he was still he was still a lot of fun. But again, I wouldn't necessarily say he had a lot of growth either. He just kind of kept making the same mistakes and falling down the same paths. He did like. There was an interesting conflict with his character where, since they all lost their powers, Mm -hmm. um, his power was like being able to come back from the dead and commune with the dead and all this, you know, stuff having to do with death. Well, he lost his powers, so now he's like a germaphobe and he's like afraid to do anything or touch anything. He he lives in Allison's basement and everything's covered in bubble wrap. (laughs) Um, He just becomes this like really like kind of <laughs> yeah um and it's you know it's not as much fun as like off the rails klaus uh i think the character the 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 story of the season that i enjoyed the most was fives um they they stumbled upon him and lila stumbled upon like he lost his like uh teleportation powers but then he sort of got them back but like in a limited way and he and Lila end up on a side quest that uh, ends up taking them like out of the timeline for a long time and they spend a long time together and their story together is really interesting to me Okay. Um, I felt really bad about the way it ended because I feel like those two actors had really great chemistry together like 
he was better he was better with her than the actor who plays Diego was with her. Mm-hmm. Mm. And also when you think about five and the fact that um you know, he's actually in his sixties. Right. Because yeah. of the, you know, forty five year detour into the apocalypse. Um and uh on this side quest with Lila, he ends up like being really happy and then they eventually find a way to get back home and it's like, oh, this this really sucks for oh. five. And uh he's just great. And that actor, I'm not gonna remember anyone's name right now, but it's okay. Five, you got the character five names. story was my favorite. Um Ben <sighs> I don't know. They got, they got stuck with the asshole Ben from the alternate universe of season three. Mm. Um, and I just didn't like him. Uh, and then Victor's, Victor's seemed like a more of a main focus this season. I mean, I guess Victor's character has always been kind of a main focus, at least in season one, because... Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Se- season one, uh, season one, he caused the end of the world, and then season two, he had the whole thing with uh, Sissy and Harlan. And now I'm not remembering what. Yeah, he he he's been a main focus, I think. And his main interaction, like his, he went off. He ends up going off with Hargreaves, right? Um, and trying to like solve the problem. The thing that was missing, I think, from this season is that, for the most part, the umbrellas were not working together. <laughs> and I think the show works much better when they're working together. Even when they hate each other and they're fighting or whatever, when the umbrellas are working together is when the show is at its best. And in this instance, they all kind of went off on their own separate stories. Um, and some were good, some were better than others, but uh, just the fact that they weren't working together, I think, took a little bit away from it. Something was missing, yeah. I'm I mean, bothered yeah. by that because that's always been the thing is like, and I don't remember necessarily how the last season ended, but I just like, there's always something that brings them back together and mm-hmm. I thought they had finally gotten over the whole like live separately, like we're better off without each other kind of thing and it sounds like there's no animosity this time, but it, like if that's the how do I put this? If that's what I'm gonna get out of this season, then to me it kind of just feels as though they're that like that could have been the epilogue. Like it didn't need to be the season. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh Methark type stuff about like where they where the kids came from in the first place, how how they got their powers, what's the origin story of Hargreaves. Mm-hmm. Um and, like, you see little bits and pieces in the previous seasons of him and his, like, original wife. Not not Grace, the robot mm-hmm. mom, but, like, his original wife. Um, and she's in this season, too, and it's just like, what? Like, the stuff that was going on with them, I barely understood. <laughs> mm. um, on the flip side, there were some new characters that were fun, particularly Nick Offerman and Megan Mullally. Um were super enjoyable to watch. They play this couple who who are named Jean and Jean. <laughs> like and it's just um and they're very weird people, um, but they like <coughs> they're like conspir they they're they're conspiracy theorists that lead this like kind of uh not a cult, but like a group that's trying to, you know, make the conspiracy like come to fruition. And uh they are a lot of fun to watch. So overall, I say this season is worth watching. Um, it could have been better, but I would disagree with people who were like, "It sucked. It was terrible. It shouldn't have happened. It should have been. Shouldn't have been a fourth season." Like, calm down. There was still plenty of good stuff in this season. Okay. Good to so, know. Yes, I recommend that you watch it. It's only six episodes. Um, Man, it's crazy how short shows are getting. It's, I it's know. wild. And thankfully, like, Netflix is doing this with a bunch of shows now where it's releasing it in two parts, which First I half, understand half the they're planning. trying to, like, keep the keep the show, like, in people's minds. Like, oh, now I can't wait for part two. Mm-hmm. Um, I think sometimes it works. Like if there's a cliffhanger that naturally occurs midway through the season, then it then it makes sense. And if gap isn't too long, 
but they've been doing this with like they did it with Bridgerton, they've done it with Emily in Paris, and these these shows it's it's not it's not working as well for. So thankfully, Umbrella Academy is it's too short to split up into two parts. That would yeah. just be dumb. Gotcha. Um, so you can get it all down fairly quickly, and I recommend that you do. Okay. Okay. All right. Very good. I'll good. give it a shot. Yeah, I saw that that had come come around, and I said, "Oh, I can't even remember. I don't think we did. We watch the last season." I honestly, don't I know. did a full rewatch before watching season four because I love the show so much, right. and I really had a fuzzy recollection. Gotcha. Of season three, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is a recap. Um, God, I love I a think. good recap. Mm-hmm. There was a recap, right, hon? Uh, I don't think that there oh, was there... a very good one. Uh, there was a recap, and I was just like, "Wow," because uh, I did not rewatch. Uh, so I was, I was pretty fuzzy on a lot of stuff because it's been a while. Um, mm-hmm. but uh, I did. Um, I would catch glimpses of what Karen was rewatching while she was uh, doing her rewatch, so that was that helped a little bit. Um, I also en- enjoyed this season, even though I was a little bit lost. I was, uh, uh, I agree with pretty much everything you said. Uh, ben, in particular, was just like, ah, I know I should care, or I know the show wants me to care about what's going on with this guy, but I just didn't really feel anything. Yeah, they and- introduced a new character. For him to interact with this season, it was like two eleventh hour for me to really care about them. Uh, yeah, and I agree that Luther didn't get enough growth, and it it just it smelled of the whole uh, you know, super shortened uh, seasons. You know, it's like, well, here's another show that probably could have used a little bit more breathing room, a little bit more uh, for a little bit more character growth, and uh, we just we don't have the time or the budget or don't want to spend the money or something. I don't know. TV's in such a gross place right now. It's kind of uh, nutty. Yeah, so I'm going back and rewatching things. <laughs> yeah, I'm watching Dragon Ball. Like, we watched, what was it? We watched the first half of uh, uh, Cobra Kai, and like, I'm sure I'll, I'll be more interested in talking about the the, the second, how, see, see how the second half of the final season goes, because I gotta say, the first half did really, didn't really do it for me. Mm. Um... <laughs> Not good. Damn it. Really being hopeful for that, and I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> Look, they could, still, you said about they it. could still they could still stick the landing. They could still even like have the the ending be decent enough. And I'm not even sure if it's an ending, right? Because they've got whatever that uh uh movie that's that they're working on. There's a karate kid movie that apparently crosses over with the Jackie Chan thing in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> what? I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't heard any of that. I, 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 I really yeah. want it to stop because it was really, really good. And it started to get kind of kooky in the last season. I'm like, all right, wrap this shit up, okay? Give me an ending and don't go too far off the rails. And thus far, the first half of it's just been like, okay, no one's acting like a human being. Like, <laughs> nobody is cartoons. reacting to any situation like a person would and that was what made the first chunk of this show so special was that you're taking these fucking cartoon characters from the karate kid movies and you're kind of sort of humanizing them while also being pretty nutty and bizarre Mm -hmm. and uh (coughs) this this first half of this one's just like none of these none of these reactions feel earned this is all just completely bad shit um but they still have another half a season to bring it home, so okay. cross my fingers. Um, real quick, before we take our break, did I mention the most American television show ever created last <laughs> episode? Like that I, I don't think yeah. so. Okay, so I don't know how I came across this, but I did. I'm glad I did. Um, it is from the BBC, okay? Oh, so that boy. means it's supposed to be highbrow and good. Is but that what that means? Apparently, the BBC decided to redo American Gladiators. Okay. Oh, my God. And they just called it Gladiators. Gladiators. Oh, that's why it's not called. That's we saw why. that listed. Okay. And we were yeah. like, why isn't it American? Okay. I shit you not. It is the most American television show I have ever seen. And when I say American, I'm talking America. Like, 
It is American Gladiators mixed with WWE and fucking Looney Tunes. Like, it is wild and very much worth the watch, especially if you have a fond remembrance of American Gladiators. So check it out. Just wanted to throw that out there because I couldn't believe when I started it. I'm like, this can't be what I think it is. And it wasn't. It was way more than what I thought it was. So, huh. huh. All right. With that, let's take a quick break so that when we get back, we could talk about the feature topic, which was my choice this week. And it was, uh, it was, a, it was a interesting ride. So mm-hmm. stay tuned. Hi everyone. Chris here. Podcast listening is free, but podcast creation is not. That's why the Geekade Patreon exists. In an effort to help us pay the bills, we've got a Patreon page set up where you can gain access to our monthly podcast topic schedule, get early access to many of our shows, and more. If you'd like to help support Geekade and keep these shows running week after week, head over to the Geekade Patreon page, linked in the show notes of this very podcast. We are Safe at Home, the leading dog rescue in the heart of New Jersey. Are you searching for a loyal companion, a dog that will bring love and joy to your home? Look no further than Safe at Home. At Safe at Home, we believe in giving every dog a second chance. We rescue, rehabilitate, and find loving forever homes for dogs in need, right here in the Garden State. Our dogs are ready to make a lasting impact on your life. Each one has a unique story, a wagging tail, and an incredible capacity for love when you adopt from safe at home you're not just gaining a pet you're becoming a part of our family our dedicated team ensures a seamless adoption process providing ongoing support and guidance with new jersey's beautiful parks beaches and trails you and your new furry friend will have endless opportunities for adventures and cherished memories safe at home relies on the support of compassionate individuals like you Your donations and volunteer work enable us to continue saving lives and finding forever homes for these amazing dogs. Join us in creating a safer, happier community for dogs in New Jersey. Together we can make a difference and give every dog the chance to feel safe at home. Visit our website or call us now to learn about how you can be a part of the Safe at Home mission. Safe at Home, because every dog deserves to be loved and protected www.safeathomerescue.org When you hear the words cross-stitch, you probably think of a grandma lovingly making a Christmas stocking, a picture of a lighthouse, or maybe a Bible verse with flowers. But that's not what we do at Shoot the Moon Stitches. We take the old-fashioned art of cross-stitch and pair it with contemporary themes and imagery to create striking works of art that make the perfect gift for anyone who grew up with the internet and has a wicked sense of humor and an appreciation for pop culture. From cult favorite TV shows and movies to retro video games to TikTok trends, if it's made you smile, chances are we've stitched it. You can shop our selection of art and gifts by going to Etsy.com and searching Shoot the Moon Stitches. For all your fun, feminist, fandom, fiber art needs, visit Shoot the Moon Stitches. And we're back. Thank you so much for checking out the commercials. It's time to talk Tales of the Unexpected. Um, I picked this i came across it i don't know how it just you know fell across my nefarious means and it intrigued me because the show itself is a short dramas um each with a twist of some kind um and they are based on roald Dahl's stories um i i'm familiar with a couple of his stories but I know some of them get kind of weird mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. for the, the way I chose which episode to watch, because my understanding is that some of these get darker and scarier. I just said, you know, Google, tell me what the highest rated episode was. And it was episode, I want to say episode five. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Season one, episode five, the landlady, the synopsis of this is, um, Arriving at Bath to take, 
Yes, it's Bath because that was a question that we were having. Arriving in Bath to take his first job away from home, young Billy Weaver decides to take a room with a charmingly maternal and eccentric landlady. Her dog and oh, her dog and cat are not, it's not cat. Her dog and bird are both stuffed, and the only other names in her guest book seem vaguely familiar to him from some newspaper clippings. Uh, but he can't figure out why. Sadly, he will never find out because we figure out bum, bum, bum. Bum, 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 the twist. Um, so we're just going to start out right out the gate. <laughs> okay. Um, Rold introduces the episode and that man is all sorts of creepy, like uncomfortably creepy. Cause he's looking you dead in the face and he's like, Hey, if you, I think this is funny. Okay. <laughs> If you don't think this is funny, maybe we don't have the same sense of humor, but don't think that this can't happen because it could fade to black show starts. <laughs> yeah. Like it kind of just made me wonder how many bodies he has in his like, basement. It, it is a, it, it, it did send up some red flags. Um, so the episode itself was, a, it features a total of technically five people. Um, not including Rold, who introduces him. We have the landlady, clergyman, um, Billy Weaver, Christopher Mulholland, and Gregory Temple. Um, so Billy Weaver is a insurance salesman who is being sent to Bath to take up a new job. Um, on the train ride there, he has a weird brief interaction with a clergyman who is asleep but wakes up. When he arrives at Bath and he gives him the download of, hey, if you're new here, this is the hotel you want to go to. But they're also a bunch of bed and breakfasts or B&Bs, as he calls them, and then had to explain what B&B stood for because this is 1970-something. Um, <laughs> and uh, he said, just head down that block. As Mr. Billy is walking down in the area, we see the landlady and the episode starts with her setting up her home and then we flash to him training in and then back out to her peering out the window waiting for Billy to make his decision because he happens to be standing right outside this bed and breakfast. Um, he decides to ring the bell. She immediately answers the door, startles him, brings him inside and we get the sense that there's something seriously wrong with this woman. Um, first off, because she has no sense of personal bubble. Like, like she is up in this man's grill. What uh, is personal like space? It was, it was uncomfortable how close talking she was doing. Uh, but she keeps saying things like, uh, I, you know, this is my home. I want you to feel like this is your home. She's being very sweet, very tenderly. And there nah, she's straight weird. Yeah. Then, well, she is weird. Um, but as she's showing him around, she explains you have to come down and you know sign the guest book when you're ready. He comes down. There are only two other names in the guest book. And we find out that those two people are Gregory and Christopher, and they are currently staying at the house. And Never hopefully we get to meet them. Um, turns out she's a taxidermist, and we do get to meet her because them because it turns out she drugs him and i'm going to assume stuffs him because christopher and gregory are in another room very yellow and it's just just not good um, that woman seriously was made of red flags it was so so weird like made of yeah flags. you couldn't make this today because anybody with like half a brain would be like nope i'm out of here yeah this is a definite like like it, there's a lot of nopes going on like nope nope no uh-uh like the this the, the taxidermied bird the taxidermied dog you know the the uncomfortableness of how close she is with everything um the way she talks about people first in the past tense then in the current tense and like it's just there was a lot of weirdness going on um i did enjoy this episode because it it, it gave me like i don't know if you guys know like night gallery and in slight twilight like the, the precursor mm. to the twilight zone and night gallery kind of shows where 
you know there's going to be a twist. You're not really sure what the twist is going to be, but you can feel there's going to be a twist. This is just very early. This is, you know, very early interpretations of this. Um, I am definitely going to watch other episodes of this to see. I don't, my understanding is they go all over the place because they are dramas. They're not necessarily all horrors. Um, but what, I personally enjoyed it. How did, uh, what did you guys think? What was this? Gave what was me... this called again? Sorry. Tales of the Unexpected. Unexpected. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Karen. I was just going to say it gave me like a weird little bit of, um, seventies nostalgia. Mm-hmm. Um, because I'm, you know, just barely a seventies baby. And, like so like the authenticity was there for me i'm like i think my dad's suitcase was exactly the same that this guy has Mm -hmm. like the the soft-sided brown leather one Mm -hmm. and um there was a lot of tension built like so we had this conversation my and i about how quickly uh shows and movies cut from scene to scene mm-hmm. or, or or visual to visual and it's it's really short now because the, the 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 human attention span is much shorter but this show built tension with really extended scenes like too long at point but like i understood what they were trying to do it, i don't the know pacing that, was yeah. definitely like from another time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the the one thing i will say about pacing was that when he makes his decision, I felt like they were beating us over the head <laughs> with that, like, cut to his face, cut to a sign, bed and breakfast, cut to his face, mm, bed and breakfast, cut to his face again, uh, bed and <laughs> breakfast. I was like, kill me now. Like, just just end it. This is the tor- this is the thing that makes me afraid is that I'm going to have to watch more of this. Oh, that's hurtful. <laughs> I was so annoyed by it, but otherwise I loved the storytelling and the pacing. That was just like the most drawn out. I was like, dude, we get it. He made a decision. Just fucking walk in. <laughs> it could have been a 15 minute episode. Yes. I'll yeah. give you that. <laughs> uh, Chris, what did you think? Oh, I thought it was pretty neat. I mean, I, you know, I kind of, you know, obviously saw it coming from a billion miles away. Like, oh, this lady kills people, no question. I wasn't, you know, 100% sure she was stuffing people until she mentioned the taxidermy. I was like, oh, yeah, the other two guests, they're totally stuffed in the other room. And then, yeah, they, they absolutely were. Uh, it, it was it de- definitely old old, t- old TV. Uh, it was very um, old TV. I find very relaxing uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> to, the, to the point where I often fall asleep. So I did get a little get a little drowsy during this one, but not you know necessarily in a bad way. It was yeah, it was it was definitely dated, but it was uh, definitely interesting enough to be worth watching. Um, <clears throat> well enough acted, um, creepy. But... The casting though, that kid, they're like when he was like, oh, I'm 18. I was like, the hell you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What did I say? He's a 1970s Toby Maguire. That's what I kept seeing. I kept seeing a young Spider Man. <laughs> um, it was a product of its time, and not in a bad way. Like this is how, like especially suspenseful type of shows like it just drew everything out um the costuming was like nothing spectacular like it was just everyday attire like you could feel it everything was supposed to be set in the 70s um i remember and you made the comment of that is the world's largest or widest tie his necktie was as big as his head his tie (laughs) was it was gigantic i'm still not a hundred percent if we needed the creepy sleeping preacher or or the the priest i still think he was in that on was it. a little odd uh, it was weird like i fully believe i agree with you hun that he was in on it he was helping the landlady get bodies for her collection um but what does he get out of it i don't know maybe that it's just her fun weird to... tea and company i don't know <laughs> i like it's the way jollies. after he drinks the tea he's like i it tasted bitter she's like yeah of course it tasted bitter it was poison you schmuck like <laughs> like oh Come on now, be nice. I had a question. I did not pick up on it, but like 
or where it came from, but she kept calling him other names. And I kept like in my head, like who the fuck is Mr. Perkins and Mr. Wilkins? Like who are, why these specific names? We actually at one point in time rewound to make sure that she didn't use the same name twice. It was, it made no sense to me other than she is crazy pants. Well, it definitely made me question her capabilities. Uh, Because if she keeps forgetting names in the middle of trying to remember them, how is she supposed to remember all the steps to... You know what? I don't know how that works. But uh, I got the impression that it was supposed to imply that she's killed so many people she can't even keep track. Ooh, that's an interesting way to go. I did not see... I didn't think that way because... That was my thought as well. She's like, I can go back and check the guest book. And I'm like, bitch, you need an instruction manual. But also... (laughs) Check the guest book. Yeah. It, it, well, it, you know, some people are like genius at one thing and crap at everything else, and I think this is just the, that that kind of case. She's crap lady. at personal space. <laughs> it was weird, like because like she she goes to bring. But she him was upstairs. also not good at taxidermy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> she goes to bring him upstairs to show him the bedroom. She opens the door and he's like, "Go ahead in." And she goes, "No, no, no, you go first. But she's standing in the fucking doorway, like. Get out of the way. <laughs> Let the man through if you're going to do that. But nope, right there you know, in the bubble. Um, I don't, I've never heard of this show before. I'm actually kind of interested to see what other stories he has told because he, what else, like, he, what are his James and the Giant James Peach? James and the Giant Peach, right? Like, it's yeah, he's written a lot of actually children children's books yep. and like they're matilda. all kind of weird yep that was the next matilda. one i was gonna say yeah uh, i feel like roll doll so the thing about roll doll is i feel like truly he has like the darkest sense of humor um and also like some weird trauma that he was trying to work through with his books because um i think they had a movie that came out bfg Yes. Yep. Big fucking giant, but it wasn't big fucking giant. Right. That's why I always. That's what gets me stuck on that. Um, friendly giant. Um, and he also wrote Fantastic Mr. Fox and Charlie and the he Chocolate did. Factory. And wait, he wrote Charlie and Chocolate Factory. Yeah. Wait, let me look yes, this man. man up. Yeah. Fantastic I was pulling, Mr. Fox. I was pulling the witches. For this. James and Giant Peach. BFG. Wow. Ellie went through a big rolled doll phase, like fairly recently. And we're we're, we're like, well familiar with him. Um, didn't Damn. Netflix was either Netflix or Amazon get like the rights to a bunch of his stories, and they were gonna redo them? <coughs> like, I this, think I vaguely remember something about that. There's a, he's yeah, yep, 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 yep. So the gremlin. That's where. Wait, so the, the wow. Matilda, um, musical that mm-hmm. where, do who like you're saying. The, the little one was into that one. Is that a Netflix or an Amazon or is it a movie? That is a Netflix. So it was a book first. Yeah, no, then it was... Netflix got the rights then. That's what I'm saying. Right, yes. Okay. Yeah. And if you ever watch the music videos, uh, that Matilda stuff goes hard if you pair it with Rob Zombie. Just saying. <laughs> Just... <laughs> I mean, the music from the musical itself is pretty good, if you ask me. But you didn't ask me. Well, I'm asking you now, Karen. It's pretty good. <laughs> He's got a, I mean, especially if you if you are eight years old, <laughs> as you know we are. Um, Perfect. So yeah, I, I I think this is a it was a, a an interesting find. I'm kind of glad that I I I, it, I fell upon it, and I will watch the rest of these at some point in passing, kind of thing. I'm not going to sit down and and power through it, but just you know, half hour episode here and there is something nice to have. I do love it because, like, you mentioned Twilight Zone, and Twilight Zone was in, like, the 50s and 60s, and this is the late 70s that this Mm -hmm. show came out. So, like, I think it's cool because I feel as though it definitely took inspiration from the Twilight Zone. Right. Um, And seeing, like, I guess, like, another generation's interpretation of this kind of storytelling is really fun. And you know I love this kind of stuff, so I'm... I'm all the yeah, way so, in. Like there was a, a run of shows like this. Cause like night gallery was another show like that, where it, that it was more horror based. Like they were all scary stories, but it was uh, just episodic. Like there was no continuing story. And I, I really liked those 
yeah. things that you could just pop in at any point in time. You don't need to watch the whole season or, or whatnot. Um, More of an anthology. Yes. Yeah. And some great, great storytelling. Like original classic Twilight Zone and Night Gallery is like fantastic stuff. And I I feel like this has the ability to do be that as well because, you know, the author's bona fides is great. Like it's granted it's known as kid stuff, but fucking Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or whatever that the original name of that was not a, a, a it was not the fun story that we <laughs> Well yeah, but I mean even look at Matilda when I mean the Chokey, like yeah. where the fuck like Mrs. Trunchbull is like legit torturing kids in that book. Like I, I really question things and that she, might have happened she was to like her. responsible for the dad's death and like yeah. stole the house and like uh, yeah it, it, matilda's a fucked up story and i yeah and i and charlie I'm and like, the chocolate factories kind of fucked up too like the things that happen to all those kids and then the oompa yeah. loompas just come and be like they done fucked up <laughs> oompa loompa doompa dee doo peace out <laughs> are are they gonna be okay who the fuck cares look over here you're in hell now <laughs> <laughs> oh did you not know you died on the way in you all died did Vegas. you want to go through the tunnel again because i don't think you do <laughs> so yes okay well that was an uh, it's, it's such an interesting find that I, I'm so glad that there's still television out there that will, you know, surprise me for not being bad. <laughs> if that I'm, makes I'm sense. I'm glad that you all watched it though, Chris and Karen, because I know I knew that it was going to have some creepiness to it, and I know that like that was the homework. But at the same time, like it could have very easily just been something that you're like, I don't like creepy stuff. No, thank you to this. And I felt like it was. They did a good job of... I, I, okay, wait. The music. Did you feel like they were trying to disarm you a little bit with the music? Mm-hmm. Because, like, it starts out kind of like, oh, this is just like a wholesome, like, coming-of-age story for this teenage boy. No, it's not. She's <laughs> real creepy. She's well, real it, it's, creepy. It's disarming. Like, because it that's the, the, the intro to the world is to make you want to be there kind of thing. And when you are introduced to the bad character in the very beginning. It's very lighthearted to, to, to mm. throw you off the, the, the trail that you know, this broad's crazy. So, um, yeah, that's that it's definitely purposeful that it was lighthearted and yeah. there was no switch until he started getting wibbly wobbly because he got, you know, roofied. So, yeah, just a lot of like a lot of horror stuff came out, you know, in that time period. So I think that it's, cool that they're that there's a more subtle approach i'm really i'm excited to learn more about roll doll's fucked up head (laughs) (laughs) oh well all right um uh with that i uh, appreciate y'all watching it um let's get the spiel out of the way so that we can move on and, and figure out what our homework is Chris? That sounds like a wonderful plan. This week's episode is not filmed before a live studio audience, but it is fueled by feedback from listeners like you. You can get in touch with us in a multitude of ways. We have an official Geek Aid Discord, where there's an entire This Week's Episode channel dedicated to all things TV talk, and of course, the regular Geek Aid social media accounts linked to in the show notes. The four of us can be found in various ways. You can read my work at StoneAgeGamer.com and in the pages of Nintendo Force magazine. Karen, where can people find you? At STM Stitches on Facebook, Instagram, Etsy, and TikTok. Angie, where can people find you? Go to my website, AngelaFernot.com. It'll take you to everything else I do. And Evan, where can people find you? No, uh, check out Tales of Cape Fear dot com. Uh, the fifth book today went out to print. My lovely wife took care of that today, so pay attention to that so that you can follow along with us. Yeah, lovely. If you need to know more about the shows we discussed tonight or what we'll be watching in the future, have a look at our show notes. And if you have any other questions at all, we can always be reached at mail at com. Just include the words this week's episode in the subject line so we know who you're trying to reach. This show is available anywhere fine podcasts are sold, including in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and more. Wherever you decide to listen, please like, comment, subscribe, and leave reviews because any and all feedback is welcome and appreciated. Again, as always, keep your eyes on Geekade for more fresh, original content. Back to you, Evan. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Chris, it is your ch- pick this week, isn't it? It is. All right. So lay it on us. What's our homework? 
Hold on one second. Uh oh. I I originally was going to go with the pilot episode, but then I I are you, are when you, you said what you did, <laughs> like let's just look at whatever. What's the best rated episode of said show? So. Um, God damn it! If you make us watch Law and Order. Kukong. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm. I don't even know where to begin with he this because it's not narrow that down. <laughs> yeah, it's not like a what's it, it like your show is an anthology show. This isn't like that, and I don't want to jump in the middle of something. So when I was a kid, um, <laughs> back when I still had a bedtime, I would love to. Uh, my mom would watch this show, and she would let me stay up to watch the uh, the intro to this show, which had a really catchy uh, theme song. And a very memorable moose walking through a bunch of streets. Um, (laughs) I've never watched this show before. (laughs) I've always been interested in it. And my mom has always told me that she thinks I would like it quite a bit. Uh, And then I was talking to my friend Matt not that long ago. And he mentioned this show. And I was humming the theme song. And I was like, yeah, I'm aware of it. I've just never really spent any time watching it. He said, you in particular absolutely have to try watching this show. Um, So I have decided that we will be watching the pilot episode of Northern Exposure. (laughs) <laughs> interesting um out of curiosity you requested this have you watched it yet i have not i decided to save it for this All right. i didn't want to try to background watch it per se until i had you know gotten a feel for it i think so okay i wanted to actually sit and watch it you know this was such a this this show was such a part of like life in my house that i didn't know about because it was happening while i was in bed you know Mm-hmm. It was like, this was the show my mom watched when we went to bed, and uh, I loved staying up to watch the intro, and then that was kind of that. Apparently it's about a, re- a, a radio DJ, and uh, it's supposedly very, very good. So, it also recently got places. Like, I think it was actually hard to find before very recently, mm-hmm. uh, even in, like, pirated circles of, like, actually finding original versions of it that had the original music in it and stuff, so... I'm I'm very okay. curious. I'm excited. Right. Well, there you go, everyone. That's your homework. Northern Exposure, Season 1, Episode 1, The Pilot. All right. Well, I think that about wraps it up from all of us here at this week's episode. I'm Evan. I'm Angie. I'm Karen. <laughs> it has ceased to be. <laughs> Good night. And this concludes our broadcast day.